Well, good morning from St. Barts in Midtown Manhattan. My name is Peter Thompson. I serve as the vicar here, and it is my joy and delight to welcome you to the forum, where each week we hold sacred conversations about the things that matter. Uh, it feels like uh, late 2021, early 2022, because we're having a virtual conversation today, uh, and uh, Peggy King George is with us. Uh, for, unfortunately, because of illness, she's unable to be with us in person. Um, but Peggy, we're so grateful that you're you're willing to join us virtually. Peggy is a cultural projects consultant who has worked for three New York City mayors. She was a pivotal figure in the initial preservation of the African burial ground in Lower Manhattan, and she has since drawn on that experience to consult with a number of other projects, including most recently the preservation of a burial ground for enslaved Africans on the British territory of St. Helena. Her role in preserving that burial ground is featured in the upcoming documentary, A Story of Bones, which was just premiered last year at the Tribeca Film Festival. Mm -hmm. Peggy, thank you so much, especially under the circumstances for mm -hmm. joining us this morning. Well, thank you for still having me. I'm in a safe space, <laughs> but thank you very much. I'm I'm really honored to be here. Thanks. Well, so much. You've had decades of experience. Um, I wonder if you can take us back 30 years plus now mm -hmm. uh, when uh, you first found out about the African burial ground and uh, tell us about what that moment was like and how you got involved in making sure this important part of our history was recognized and preserved. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, uh, yeah, I was working in the mayor's office of construction under Mayor David Dinkins. Um, and during that time, uh, someone brought to my uh, attention an environmental impact statement, which had uh, the history about the ground. Um, for some people may know that in the city of New York, um, in, in order for you to build, you really must know the history of the ground that you're going to build on, right? And so within this document, which the federal government had commissioned um, professionals to do research, you know, scientists, um, there was a map uh, of the African burial ground and a description of that site. And as a part of that assessment, there were archaeologists and historians who talked about the importance of whether you know anything was remaining or not. That it would be important to learn uh, as much as we could about the African New York's African population, enslaved and free. So it was during my time at the mayor's office because I was overseeing uh, capital construction projects, meaning projects that any kind of construction happening at. Um, any of the cultural institutions in the city of New York, the museums, the aquarium, uh, botanical garden. And so I became interested, but I didn't know who to talk to. And one thing led to another. Um, and I slowly began to wear different hats throughout this process, but it was significant because we, I was working for New York's first African-American mayor and this construction was getting ready to happen just north of City Hall Park. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a huge long story. I would, in, I would encourage anybody to go to the ground. There's an interpretive center that talks about the movement um, behind that struggle. Um, it was very new, you know, uh, the, the government, the US government has learned to uh, put rules and laws in place to deal with indigenous um, people, uh, native, the first people of uh, America. Uh, and yet this was really new for uh, enslaved, the history of enslaved Africans uh, and free. And, and of course, one of the biggest challenges is that historically, sites that are, are important and should be important to our community and should be important to America, um, they were not being protected it, as a rule, uh, just the attitudes about this kind of site. So um, during that time, as I wore various hats, I ultimately went on to become the uh, executive director for the Federal Steering Committee for the African Burial Ground. This was the committee that had been designated um, by Congress to come up with a plan for memorialization. And after that committee was done and we would meet with, we'd meet up in the Schomburg Center up in Harlem. It was open to the public, people could participate. Um, and after that plan was 
uh, put together. I had to craft it for the steering committee and submit it to Congress. Uh, I then returned to the mayor's office to then decide. It became a pivotal part of my career where I decided this is the kind of work that I wanted to do. I wanted to work with community. Um, my background is in design and architecture, uh, but most of the work that I did was oversight of construction and working with architects and designers and public artists. And I decided I wanted to leave city government and work with community developers um, to preserve these sites and that they're to, to see a way forward. And um, when I decided to leave, that's when the federal government contacted me to say that they would like to hire me as their consultant to run the national design competition. And under my leadership, I then um, ran the a national design competition and we now have our first national monument uh, honoring enslaved and free Africans um, in New York. So that's a short version, but you can ask other questions that sure on parts of it. Um, well, t tell us a little bit about when you first recognized that this was such a significant site and what that process was like for you. Where it impacted me personally, um, I had lost my father who was a civil rights attorney in Southwest Georgia. I grew up in Albany, Georgia. Some people may know it as Albany, Georgia. Um, and uh, this was the Deep South and I grew up during the civil rights movement. I, in first grade, I integrated my first grade uh, class in a white public school. Um, my father had been the attorney that filed suit against the city to make sure that the school was integrated. So this was 1964. Um, so I grew up around a lot of leading figures in the civil rights movement. I grew up in the churches, and I say churches because we had a family church, but for many people who understand the civil rights movement, um, any church in the Black community served as a refuse, as a facility for people to speak truth about what was happening socially um, and, and, and served as a facility for the movement. So growing up in that environment and watching my parents um, do what they did, my father during the Albany movement represented Martin Luther King when he's jailed um, in, in Albany, um, and Ralph Abernathy, and you know, so these were all people who were not foreign to me. In addition, I grew up with people who were part of the SNCC movement, many of whom were students who were out of New York, who were of many different faiths, races, uh, everybody. And one of them being, uh, she wasn't part of the SNCC movement, but she was in law school and she came and she wanted to work under my father. He was a mentor to her. And that is Elizabeth Holtzman in the city of New York. And many people will know Elizabeth's leadership in New York. Um, so I grew up knowing her. So to finally come to a project at one point, to come to a site where there's this, had this deep meaning historically and culturally, I, you know, I, I, of course, I couldn't help but want to know more. And upon an occasion when I went to the site to take a tour, this is after ground has been broken, the federal government, it was property that had been owned by the city, but given to the federal government to develop because they needed the land for, um, or, you know, they decided that they needed the land for office building. Um, the... The idea was that archaeologists were going to go in and do some tests to see whether there were intact remains still there or what was there, right, historically. And I remember there was a um, sort of an inside office, city office tour, just with a small group of us. And we got to the fence. And at the time, I had heard that there was a gag order that the federal government had issued that the archaeologists and historians should just not really talk about very many of the details. Being in government, I kind of know that, but I took offense to it. And um, as we were standing there, a question was put to an archaeologist. I was the only African-American in the group. Um, they were very curious about are there enslaved people because you people just did not associate enslaved Africans with New York and the North. And, um, you know, they wanted to know, can you know, do you know, how do you know that they're, they're there? 
And the response from the archaeologist um, was one that was very evasive, one that was noncommittal, one that kind of pushed it aside. This, you know, we shouldn't focus on that. And on the heels of my father having passed, I was suddenly struck. It, what struck me was, in terms of being offended, was that knowing the work that my father and so many other African American people had done in terms of freedom, rights, the struggle, um, to then 100, 200 years later, for someone to, you know, at the side of a site where they may be buried, say, well, you know, it's not important, we you know, and, and just deem them invisible, non-existent, we won't talk about it. It struck me personally, and I thought, no, people, you know, people who were enslaved didn't love being enslaved. This was a condition imposed upon them. And it would be, um, you know, this, this, I, this comfort level where people are okay with talking about it as if the enslaved were okay with their condition. There had to be resistance on every level. And we, even when we talk about abolitionism, you always, you cannot talk about that without speaking to the first abolitionists who were the enslaved Africans themselves. Mm -hmm. So that was probably the biggest impact. And at that moment, I, I think I just made a personal commitment that I was somehow going to be involved. I didn't know how I could be involved. I wasn't very high up on the totem pole. I mean, you know, I was a worker bee in the mayor's office. And, um, you know, one of the, the gentlemen who brought the whole story to my attention or the fact that this history was there was actually a friend, a friend to many people. He was an older gentleman who worked in parks, city parks, and he was German American. His name was Harry Worcester and he worked for the New York City Parks Department. And he was the guy who would go around to every office and because he did a lot of the planting in City Hall Park, he would leave seeds and tell you how to plant them <laughs> and everybody knew Harry. And Harry dropped by um, and said, you know, I wanna show you something. And he shared this map and he said, you know, Peggy, I grew up in Manhattan, you know, in the German American kind of community. And he said, I consider myself a history buff. And this is history that I've never heard of. And he felt compelled to try and say to somebody, we need to, somebody needs to like let the mayor know this is our first African American mayor. So there were, you know, a combination of my own personal experience, listening to Harry, who was an older gentleman who grew up in New York City who, you know, was just shocked at the history. And then he would periodically come by and say to me, um, have you talked to the mayor yet? And I'm like, Harry, I'm not that high up. But I have to figure it out. You know, I'm going to generate memos and try and go through the chain if I can. But um, yeah, I was, I, I, my passion grew out of how is it that we save this? Because I would hate for my father's story and my mother's story and so many others who, who really, you know, gave their careers and their lives to um, the civil rights movement, to, um, you know, fighting racism and segregation and all of those things that stem from, you know, slavery, enslavement, uh, and that whole construct. Yeah. So um, I... Uh, I'm guessing there were some debates that that it wasn't so easy to to the process from discovering that the burial ground existed to a uh, national monument. Can you talk about some of the the moments along the way in that fight? Yeah. Um, oh, there were. You know what? There were many debates on a lot of on a multitude of levels. Um, and when I look back on these debates, on some of these debates, and I'll share some of them with you, but when I look back on them, it's 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 like growing pains. It is what we had to do to really understand a project like this and really begin to set precedents on how we were going to move forward. Because anything that we did on this project 
we were really trying to set precedents for projects to come because we knew that, you know, if a burial ground of this size, which is estimated to be about five New York City blocks, there are burial grounds in other places and people were coming forward and saying, yeah, there's a cemetery that's that hasn't been cared for or there's a cemetery I researched and it's under a parking lot. Um, so some of the debates, you know, there were debates within the African-American community. There were debates, you know, with the federal government, with city government, with state. Um, and I would say for me, you know, my activism was within the the, the structure of um, the city government because, you know, you color within the lines. You don't go above your, you know, whoever your boss is or their boss is. And I found that because sometimes of non-response, I was writing above certain people. Um, and I was terrified <laughs> of losing my job, but you know, it was, you know, there's one thing to to think about. You don't look so far down the road when you're you're just committed to something that you think is right. Um, but there were debates about, you know, initially on the maps, the, the burial ground was, it was written up as the Negroes burying ground. And the community was very vocal in uh, public meetings with the federal government and all elected officials that we will not recognize it as the Negroes burying ground. That is what Europeans gave that name. We will, they will be, Af they are Africans. And so we will do that. So from that level to um, the federal government deciding, you know, where they would draw the line um, in terms of funding, in terms of how much they were willing to do. It went from a sign to, you know, or a little plaque to gradually the community continuing to fight um, to bring it further. There were um, uh, the uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission was very, very instrumental in helping to get the area landmarks so that we could protect the area as, you know, the struggle was going on. Um, there was a struggle uh, with who was going to get to tell our story. People, um, from what I've understood and what I, what I learned as I worked on this project, because I knew nothing, but I was meeting with archaeologists and historians, was that, you know, archaeologists, they interpret what they see and, you know, what they find in the ground. And as they interpret, and it's based on some knowledge of things that they've found from other, maybe other sites or history that they know or records that they know, but it's an interpretive science, as I was told. And when something is an interpretive science, what happens is, is the archaeologists can interpret the story today but others who are more informed in maybe the area of African-American lives and illnesses and all of that other stuff, they may take and say, well, your, your interpretation is not good. We, it's, we're much more informed and we'll have to massage that. So you had archaeologists who were on site where the community and members of the scientific community felt that those, some of those people were not as qualified to help tell and interpret this story. And there was an occasion within uh, a meeting that I was in, which was just sort of government officials. And I asked that question, you know, were there African-American professionals on your team? And so that's when I was told, well, this is an interpretive science and in our field, we're accustomed to, we'll interpret it one way and then maybe somebody else will come along and challenge that and interpret another way. And my response to that was, you know, people have been interpreting our story from the beginning of time. And this is the one opportunity where we need to be able to participate in that. Because at the end of the day, if, if you interpret our story again, we haven't changed anything. The government will take your story, print it on a glossy folder, little fold out piece and stick it in a take one holder in the lobby of the building. And you will have told the same story that everybody's been reading. So this is the time to bring folks on, to expand and really inform, be much more informed about our story. So those were, I mean, there were so many um, hurdles and debates and massaging of, um, you know, what should happen. And ultimately, 
Um, Dr. Michael Blakey, who was out of Howard University, he became the lead, um, you know, the lead, scientific leader of the project. And it was it was a triumph for the community because we felt that there was a black institution taking the lead on telling our story. If there was going to be any kind of DNA testing or study of the remains, um, that that was something that needed to be done. But those were like little milestones that have informed the so many other projects across the globe, um, which is how now I end up doing what I'm doing because I'm involved in many projects because they look to New York's African burial ground and all of the debates that were engaged there, people look for us to share what we learned. Um, and there's still so much more, really. There's still so much more. Can you tell us about some discoveries that resulted from the project and then also the the process of of kind of putting the monument together and what you can see if you go to visit the African burial ground now? Yeah, um, there were when you well, so I'll, I'll just note some of the things that I remember. I remember going on to the site at the time I was pregnant with my my first and I, I remember uh, just sharing some quick experiences, making my way onto the site and um, a woman uh, who was, I assume she was a resident of Chinatown because she was on her way with the site is really not very far. And she saw me going in and she kind of cautioned me because she knew that it was a burial ground and she cautioned me because I was pregnant. And she's, you know, she was kind of like, you know, careful, you're pregnant. And it, it was really about spirituality. It was, it was about, you know, the ancestors and um, being thoughtful about that. And what was wonderful and powerful about it is that on the outside of the site, you had many people of many faiths leaving candles, things, um, people who would call me to say they shouldn't build on the site at all. And I'm talking about across cultural lines, people would call, not just the African-American community. Um, and then going on to the site, there were um, seeing remains in certain positions that, you know, buried with their heads in the West with the idea that when they rise up, you know, um, uh, they're facing either, you know, there was some thought, I think, facing back to Africa or in that direction or the rising sun. And um, and then there were there were some burials that exhibited, and one in particular of a woman that um, exhibited severe trauma. Her arms had been brought behind her back and broken, and I think she'd had some trauma to the back of her head. Um, and it it was a serious reminder of you know what was happening and 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 you know, the horror of slavery. Um, there were objects, many of the remains were wrapped in uh, muslin and there were lots of uh, pins um, that would have held the muslin. There were mothers buried with their children. Um, so it was, it was, it, there was a level, going to the site um, provided me with I guess in a way, bringing me as close as possible to the humanity and the reality of these individuals who lived in New York, who lived, worked, died, sometimes suffered, sometimes at least had family, um, but were part of New York. Um, yeah. There were thousands of people buried there. Why do you think um, this ground went overlooked for so long? I, you know, I think I think it's it's a challenge like so many African burial grounds uh, around the world, or certainly uh, in the United States. I'm working on a site right now with a group of people in Staten Island. The, a strip mall is sitting on top of the burial ground. They didn't move the remains. They just put a, you know, a, they, there was a gas station. Now it's a strip mall, and so you've got the community um, fighting to preserve that. Site. I'm also working on another site where there was a gas station or something. Well, the remains were pulled up um, and nobody seems to know where they were put at the end. But there is this lack of um, regard for the community and the history of the community. 
And when people would come to me, I remember in the African, when the African burial ground, you know, the, all the conversations were swirling about it. It was not, um, it was not unlike someone to come to me and say, well, why is this so important? And I was just in a meeting recently on another burial ground and a woman who said to me, you know what, you've turned the light on for me because back in the day, I really didn't think there was a big deal. New York City has lots of burial grounds under there and the city's probably built on a lot of burial grounds. And what I say to people is that for me, African burial grounds and the work that I do when I encounter an African burial ground, here's what I think about. I think about the fact that archaeologists say that what defines us as human is how we bury, and what in part defines us as human is how we bury our dead. And I and thinking about that, I thought, yeah, you know, we pray over people, our loved ones, we sing over them, we may pour libations, we place special objects, important objects. We, you know, we do, we engage in a bit of ceremony about this person honoring this person. And then I think about, imagine a community of enslaved Africans in a society that says, you're not human, you're subhuman, right? You have no rights that a white man need respect. And yet on the occasion, of a loved one of theirs passing, a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, and the moment that they are allowed to go to a burial site, and even if it has all kinds of oppressive restrictions, they in that moment engage in that very human act, that act, they are reclaiming the humanity of that individual. They're singing over them, they're praying over them, they're doing whatever they can do within the restrictions of their condition in that society. And when I think about that, I think about the fact that they in fact are engaging in a revolutionary act of remembrance because they're reclaiming their humanity. And they live in a society that says, you aren't human. So for every burial that is in an African burial ground, if there are a thousand, if they're 36, if they are a hundred, that ground is a battleground. It is a ground that represents resistance. It is sacred because of the acts of the revolutionary acts of remembrance that took there. So that even if anybody took their remains out, desecrated it, it could never, for me, lose the significance as that is a place where generations of enslaved Africans and free engaged in something that said, we are human. Mm. Tell us a little bit about your experience in other sites, um, the work that you're doing now and, and the documentary. Um, I, yeah, in 2000, late 2016, I was contacted by two uh, young uh, filmmakers, British filmmakers, and a young woman uh, named Anina Van Neel, the filmmakers, uh, Joseph um, Karan and Dominic Devere. And um, they had gone to, Dominic and Joe had gone to the island to actually really do a story on the airport. There was the, St. Helena was building an airport. It's a very tiny island. It's considered the most remote island in, in the world. It's off the coast of Africa. It's kind of almost in between South America and Africa, kind of as high up where Angola is. And most people know it because that's where Napoleon was um, imprisoned and he died there. His body was buried there for a while until the French governor came. They took him away. Now the island maintains the empty tomb. Um, or at least there's a, there's a French representative that maintains and lives on the island. So the island has about 4,500 to 5,000 individuals. Um, this young woman, Anina Van Neel, 
uh, it works for the company that is doing work on the airport. Um, the airport is in an area of the island where a service road comes from the airport down into a valley. Basically, the island is just a rock. So there are lots of little valleys and peaks. And that service road unearthed um, 325 remains out of in a valley that had upwards of 10,000 enslaved Africans. And this would have been during the time that the British government uh, had abolished slavery and their naval uh, fleet was patrolling the South Atlantic, arresting anyone who was engaging in illegal slavery. Um, you know, over the surface, a good mission, but the reality of what happened was that uh, any slave ship, slavers ship that they took into port, they would arrest the, the slavers and then they would take the enslaved Africans off of the ship, those that were still living. They basically had a refugee camp there in the valley. And for those who didn't make it, they buried them in the valley. So this happened for a period of time, estimated 21,000 individuals came through the island. So some of them living on this, um, in this, a uh, little refugee place. And then they were sent on to other British islands. They were called liberated Africans, but the only way off of the island, if they wanted to leave the island, would be to go on, on a ship. You had no money, you're not paying your way. So guess what? If you're on that ship and you get to another British island, are you buying a house? Are you, you know, raising your family? No, you're not. You are now endangered and you are working on plantations. So these were not liberated people. Um, and the archaeologists say that there's no evidence of anyone being returned home. Um, and I think there were an estimated 500 um, enslaved formerly enslaved Africans who stayed on the island, but they were kind of in an isolated area and eventually matriculated in. So what you have is a valley that has upwards of 10,000 remains. Um, those 325 that were removed for the, the road, they were in storage for over 10 years. They recently got um, reburied with the release of our documentary. Um, the film team and uh, Anina Van Neel, who worked for the airport, who was a community person on the ground, really trying to bring awareness about this site and had very mixed feelings because she worked for the airport. Uh, and eventually she left, leaves the airport. But they reached out to me to say, you've done this before. How do we do it? We've got a non-responsive government, you know, people who are not sure, community who's not sure how they relate to this group, even though many are descendants of enslaved people because there was history beyond, you know, before all of this. Um, and, you know, how do we handle this? We just can't continue to impact this, gra this, this ground. Uh, and so at some point after a year of consulting virtually, I eventually went over and met with community members, the governor of the island, who's not elected, who's appointed out of London. Um, and, you know, the island is just given just enough money from the government to kind of make in sort of kind of meet. So it's that kind of thing, which, which is really a struggle that a lot of islands have. Um, so it's been a huge journey working and advising and uh, sharing what I know and advocating. Um, I then, you know, my role sort of became the global awareness person doing global outreach. I know that a lot of this this work will be in talking to elected officials. So I flew from New York and I met with two members of parliament who are very vocal when it comes to um, you know, uh, people of color uh, in, in Britain um, and showed them a trailer and talked to them to make them aware. Um, I've you know, done interviews with international newspapers um, and then at the same time, trying to build awareness now in um, in the U.S. with showing this film, which is the reason why the documentary, the, the documentary was to, you know, shed light on this history. And at the same time, it's used as an impact um, tool for Anina and myself. Anina is still on the island. She, you know, may be leaving at some point, but, um, you know, to create impact and, and hopefully encourage people even in the U.S., to see this site 
as important. And I guess here's, here's what I didn't say. When I visited the island and I saw the ground and I saw how big it was, what I realized is the ships that came to that island, even though they were they were circumvented by the British naval officers and, and brought to that island, those people on those ships were, they were bound for Brazil. They were bound for the island, what we know as the Caribbean islands, Cuba. They were bound to be sold. So those were enslaved people. So that island, in fact, is the middle passage, what we know is that middle leg of the slave trade. So when we talk about the middle passage, it kind of is up here. And now when we talk about the middle passage, you can talk about St. Helena because that was, it did serve as a stopping point um, for the mariner trade. And so for me, the impact was, it was, it was like, I'm looking at what the middle passage was. Um, and then second to that is that Americans were engaging in illegal slave trading. So many of the Africans who were buried there were because ships financed out of New York City got caught by the British naval. And then, in fact, one of the biggest cases that hit the news, and you, anybody can Google it, it's called the Orion, O-R-I-O-N, it was a ship that was built in the Northeast specifically for slave trading, which was rare because usually they retrofitted ships. It was built to carry a thousand and it was the ship captain was out of New York and it was financed out of New York. And then when they got arrested, they got sent to Boston and there was a trial about them doing it. I don't think very much happened to them. Um, but uh, at that time, I think we also had an American consulate or American office on the island. So there's a British responsibility, but there's also, you know, there are others. And and um, Britain had a relationship with the U.S., which is, you know, for any other country, they would have tried them on the island. For Americans, they would tell America, no, we'll send them back to your, you guys deal with it. But you know, that is part of that history. So we're there on that island that are, we have some responsibility. And my biggest, my biggest, um, one of the biggest dreams that I have is to try and get a screening in Google, uh, in Google's headquarters, or at least somewhere in Google, because they just recently landed a cable in that island, on that island, in that valley, right near that the African burial ground. And, you know, they named the cable actually because it runs down the whole West edge of Africa um, um, after an enslaved man who'd lived in, in, in England. So I'm sorry, I'm, you know, maybe I'm, I'm long winded, but there's so much to tell. And so it is, it's, it's, it's incredible history and it needs to be connected to our own. I mean, slavery in America, it wasn't just in this bubble. It, it was all connected. There's a global connection. And I, my goal is to try and connect all of those dots. Um, and St. Helena is one of them. Wow, absolutely. Um, can we see the documentary? Will we have the chance to do that? Well, um, hopefully, I don't have a date yet, but um, uh, PBS Point of View, their show Point of View, has agreed to show the film. I think it's late spring, early summer. We don't have a hard date yet, um, but you know, as, as soon as we get it, I'll, I'll certainly share it with you so that um, you know your parishioners uh, and anyone else that you can share with will will watch. Um, it's a very important film, and these guys work so hard on it. Uh, it's 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 amazing. And I will say also as a part of that story, I come in as a mentor to Nina, who's actually you know I had done what she was doing thirty years earlier um, with the African burial ground in New York. But after visiting there, I was trying to connect the dots. So I invited her to come to New York, of course, to see the African burial ground and to meet. I put together a, an ancestors feast at the African burial ground with scholars and historians and folks for her to meet. But also we went on a road trip 
and I took her south and showed her a cotton field in my hometown just to connect the dots between the cotton grown there, Britain supporting slavery, and the cotton that was grown in my county was, you know, sent to um, Britain for their textile industry. So, you know, the connection is real. That history is real. And for us to really tell this story, we have to connect those dots. Um, so it, it was, we, we visited Albany, Savannah, Charleston, and also Montgomery. We went to um, the, what, what is, you know, people know or call the, the uh, lynching museum, but it, it, uh, it was, it really had an impact um, connecting those dots. We only have a very few minutes. Uh, if you have questions for Peggy, you can submit them using the live chat function on YouTube, the comments function on Facebook, or you can email me pthompson at stbarts.org. If you're here in person at St. Bart's, we do have some um, comment cards uh, downstairs and you can hand those to Diana Sarbu and uh, she will get your questions to me. Uh, one question that's already been submitted has to do with the monument itself in Lower Manhattan. And if you can talk just a little bit about the design process and what visitors can expect. Um, yeah. When they oh, down. absolutely. I encourage you to go down. There is an exterior portion and then there's an interior. On Broadway, there is an entrance into 290 Broadway. There's an entrance into the Interpretive Center where you, where you will get, there's video and there's the history and you see bits of the, the science and the what was uncovered. Um, also, um, the struggle by the community, which is just as impo important. This is run by the National Park Service. And on the exterior, um, when I, um, in doing the design, we, uh, put together a design competition with the federal government. I worked with the federal government um, to do a uh, design for the monument and one for the interpretive center. And if you visit the site, you will see uh, a piece by Rodney Leon. Uh, actually, it was more, there was a whole team. The Rodney Leon is the, the name that most people recognize. Um, but there is a monument with... Um, it's sort of like a door. Uh, it it it, it remin it's reminiscent of so many other iconic uh, sites that we know of tied to to um, in, enslavement or the the journey of African Americans. But also the part of the site I think, which is much much uh, which people have said. Uh, who visited the site that have such a great impact is that there is a bermed area of, of lawn where you can place um, flowers. And it's where the reburial actually happened. All of the remains that were moved for the tower were reinterred there. Um, and so it is a burial site when you go. I mean, the whole five block area is, but that is where you see um, where the remains were put back. And so the community uses it for various ceremonies. Um, and it's just, it's, it, it is such an incredible uh, reminder of our history and, and the work that needs to be done. We have to stop momentarily, but I wonder if you can reflect a little. It is Black History Month. You've spent a lot of your career in Black history. You are a witness of Black history in terms of your father and his work. I'm wondering if you can provide some advice on how we all of us can best observe this month. Um, for those who don't know much about history of, of the African-American experience, I would say hit your libraries, hit your, um, you know, your historical societies. Um, you know, even if you're within smaller towns, uh, they're wonderful historical societies. So people always look for um, folks to do research um, and, and to learn, attend uh, other lectures uh, in local areas. Um, that's what you, it, it's really about building your knowledge um, about uh, the community and getting involved um, with 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 wanting to know the history, um, and then on occasions, you know, I'm going to cheer for burial sites. There are people all over the place fighting to save these sites. Be an advocate. Get out there. Understand what they're trying to do 
and and bring your creative juices and and you know let the community take the lead but be an advocate um for what they're trying to do because and hoping that you'll remember how i see these sites as sacred for the revolutionary acts of remembrance that happen there and and does the church have a particular role in this quest i was i was struck in reading about the african burial ground that the episcopal church played a role because the vestry of trinity church said that they wouldn't allow black people to be buried on their grounds and that's why there is an african burial yeah. ground yeah and can you say a little well, bit about it's, that it's, i i i don't know the i mean i know that much of the history with trinity but the story i will tell you is because of that history when i was helping to facilitate when i was facilitating community an opportunity for community and politicians to weigh in as we were in the early stages. I called Trinity Church and I was working in the mayor's office. So I was able to meet with Trinity Church and I said, would you host, because of this history, would you host our first community-wide meeting, city-wide meeting where people can voice their truth, their concerns, and Trinity did. They they stepped up and did that. Um, and so when you say, what can the church do? Um, it's moments like that, where you just, as I said, in, in the civil rights movement, churches were facilitated a place where people could speak their truths and could gather uh, under one roof um, without reprisal. And so, you know, I think that churches can do that. And that's what Trinity did um, for this. And in fact, it's in one of the, it is in the first documentary about the African burial ground. Trinity is there. And I'm very proud of that, actually, having gotten them to do that. Well, Peggy, unfortunately, we do need to stop. Um, we're so sorry we couldn't welcome you to St. Bart's in person today. I know. You. I love your church. I love St. Bart's. <laughs> well, we'll have to we'll have to do it in the near future. Um, it's been really great to chat with you virtually. And thank you for sharing so much of your remarkable career with us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I wish everyone a great Black History Month. Go out there and find out something new that you've never known <laughs> about uh, our history, your country's history. Thank you, Peggy. And thank you all for joining us. We hope you'll stick around whether you're in person or virtual and join us for worship at 11 a.m. And we hope you'll be back at the forum next week. We'll be welcoming Peter Coy, who's an op-ed writer for the New York Times, uh, to talk about uh, charitable giving and how we make ethical decisions about our charitable giving. Thank you all. Have a lovely Sunday. Thank you.